distinguished speakers, uh, colleagues, I'm very honored this afternoon here in Bhutan and morning in the UK to welcome a crowded uh, virtual audience in Zoom and Facebook. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, before I welcome two most distinguished speakers this afternoon, I would like to thank two individuals uh, who have been working with extraordinary commitment uh, through this series of seminars by linking us with the imminent speakers. Uh, firstly, we owe our collective gratitude to Professor Sabina for her onerous but highly beneficial uh, voluntary services in connecting us to the distinguished speakers. Uh, I wanted to say this today in view of her probable departure very soon if she can work out a flight route back to the UK. Uh, I hope you don't find a ticket back. <laughs> Uh, I also want to thank a very talented young uh, Cambridge postgraduate, uh, Yidzin Topge, who while uh, providing general support to this seminar series, also designs uh, wonderful flyers uh, that you have seen, digital flyers for these seminars. I, again, I wanted to do this today. Uh, as she might, I hope you do not, uh, as she might uh, uh, leave us at the end of the month. Now returning to the privilege of uh, welcoming the two eminent speakers. Uh, although they have been geographically far apart, uh, I actually find that they exhibit very similar trajectories in their professions uh, and undertakings of major kinds. Uh, so, for example, in 1991, uh, Professor Andrew Farmer uh, became the first GP, general practitioner, to be awarded the uh, Harkness Fellowship from the Commonwealth Fund of New York and went to the United States. In the same year, on the other side of the world, his Excellency, the Prime Minister, Dr. Lode, went to study MBBS in Dhaka University on a meritorious scholarship, and then followed uh, surgery course also in the same university. And as a result, a uh, very surprising thing is he speaks very fluent Bangla. Around 2001, uh, Dr. Andrew Farmer joined the University of uh, Oxford to carry out research in addition to being a GP. And at the same time, His Excellency the Prime Minister joined the National Referral Hospital uh, in Mongar and in Thimpu as a consultant surgeon. Next, we find that Professor Andrew, Dr. Andrew Farmer, uh, well, I, I should say, uh, has contributed enormously uh, to medical knowledge. Uh, one of his specialist areas is diagnosis, classification, and treatment of type 2 diabetes, uh, which is uh, not an unknown word amongst goodness, and now uh, suffering increasingly from this illness because of imported diets, I think. Um, so he's specialist uh, in uh, this uh, uh, particular uh, affliction, and he has done a great deal of work uh, concerning insulin and non-insulin regimes, omega-3 fish uh, supplementation, and also uh, slightly statistical works like estimation of lifetime health outcomes of type 2 diabetes patients. By 2007, uh, while still in Oxford, Professor Dr. Andrew Farmer 
became the deputy chair of the UK's Health Technology Assessment Commissioning Board. And on this side of the world, our prime minister went to study urology uh, for two years in the Medical College of Wisconsin in the United States. And then after a stint here in Bhutan, he again went to work in Singapore General Hospital and Okoyama University in Japan in 2010. By 2014, His Excellency the Prime Minister went to the University of Canberra and here I was really perplexed. Uh, he did a degree in Masters in Business Administration. By 2016, Professor Dr. Andrew Farmer, still in the University of Oxford as today, became the chair of the National Institute for Health Research and Health Technology Assessment Program. Whereas His Excellency, due to his outstanding contribution to the medical services in Bhutan, was conferred by His Majesty the King, the Order of Rare Order of Heart Son of Bhutan in 2017. And then, as you all know, for the following year, he joined politics and became the first medical prime minister of Bhutan. Professor Andrew Farmer, on the other hand, has a deep interest in the uses of health technologies, uh, wearable devices to change health behavior and computerized health interventions. Among his numerous path-breaking articles, he has also written such fascinating paper titled, I hope this is right. I cannot be sure there may be many AG farmers. Uh, uh, Dr. Andrew can confirm later. Uh, the paper title is, Does Thinking About Health Risk Increase Anxiety? Which seems to be a particularly relevant topic in the pandemic-stricken times today. And here, our Prime Minister, Dr. Lord Sering, has done a lot to reduce the anxiety amongst the Buddhist population. And for his outstanding handling of the pandemic in this country, he was again conferred uh, a great honor last year by His Majesty the King. So with this very brief introductions to rather outstanding and voluminous output of these two individuals. I'm very happy and honored to request His Excellency, Dr. Lord Sering, Honorable Prime Minister of Bhutan, uh, to uh, commence the one hour dialogue with Professor Dr. Andrew Fama. We very much look forward to this dialogue today. Sir, Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tasho. I I really don't know how to start. I have to change uh, my opening statement after hearing Tashka Mura's uh, manner and the way Tasho introduced uh, Dr. Andrew and myself. I don't know about the credentials that Tasho Karmura made about uh, Dr. Andrew, but uh, mine, I thought it was correct. And uh, I'm really surprised that Tasho could draw similarities between two individuals that have never met actually. Physically, we are miles, thousands of miles apart, but deep down, deep down, I think we are very, very close. Going by the, by, 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 uh, uh, the works that Dr. Andrew had done. And uh, for me, even if I have not done even if I have not achieved that path that uh, Dr. Andrew has achieved, uh, that is where my heart goes, and that is where exactly where I would like to the path that I would like to uh, walk. So thank you very much, Tasho Karma, and uh, uh, your institution for bringing us together. And Dr. Andrew, we may be meeting virtually for the first time this time, but you must allow me to be very close with you. You must allow me to work with you very closely and learn from you from today onwards. So. Uh, uh, with this, uh, I welcome Dr. Andrew and the uh, rest of the rest of the participants here. 
I see a lot of my senior, my teacher, gurus from the hospital also attending this conference. I hope I can do some justice, uh, uh, not from my own knowledge, but trying to extract what Dr. Andrew has for us. So with this, uh, uh, again, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. We all know we are going through some extraordinary times. We all know health is very, very close to everyone's heart, not by choice, but by many, many obvious reasons. We all know that. One thing that we cannot compromise is on health. And when I say health, I always mean uh, uh, a quality, quality of healthcare. And as I'm not going to describe what quality of healthcare means, but in my own de uh, definition means it must be something that is relevant, something that must be easily available. You cannot have uh, hi-fi medical facilities around the corner, but if you don't get it when you actually uh, needed it, then that is no healthcare for us. For that, uh, on that note, uh, we are a totally different country, I would say, if Dr. Andrew had not visited Bhutan. We are a mountainous country. Uh, um, mode of communications is one of the hardest in the world. We do not have good uh, uh, networking system in terms of health referral system. And uh, yes, on the, on the uh, international uh, statistics, we may uh, be rated quite, quite good in terms of literacy, but in terms of health literacy, I should admit that we are not that good. But as we go along, the pandemic came us, pandemic took us by surprise. As we know, health is a field where lots of advances have taken place. Uh, obviously, that is where it is needed. And we also know that uh, digitalization uh, is taking health uh, at a very, very fast pace, whether you call it digitalization, digital health, or AI, or whatever you call it. But uh, in health, it has always been there. But how far has it changed or is it going to change uh, because of the pandemic? How fast is, this, is, this, uh, is the change needed to avert, to stop this pandemic as well as to prepare ourselves for another pandemic? Because uh, any talk that we do, be it on health or non-health activities, if you do not talk in the language of COVID-19 pandemic, I don't think we'll be doing justice uh, to our uh, situation that we all are in. So with this, uh, I would like to welcome and request Dr. Andrew to, to please let us and let the floor know how this pandemic is going to change uh, uh, already fast, fast, rapidly digitalizing medical field. Um, Your Excellency, thank you very much for that, that very kind introduction. And um, uh, Dr. Kava, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction too. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity just to sort of talk perhaps for, for, for five to 10 minutes as, as an introduction uh, and then, um, you know, continue what, what I, I'm sure will be a really instructive and, and, and uh, interesting dialogue. Um, I should just clarify that I'm, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, I, I, I have roles in the uh, UK uh, National Institute for Health uh, and Research Programme, uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the views that I express are not necessarily those of the NIHR and the, the UK uh, uh, Department of Health and, and, and Social Care. I, I think there, there are two things uh, that, that you said that I should just acknowledge. One is, is, is as you say, COVID is, is really central to, to, to our discussions. Um, uh, it, it, it's a threat to, to both our countries and, and, and it took us very much by, by surprise. Um, uh, but speaking from, from the UK point of view, I, I think you, you're absolutely right in what you suggest, that it has made a, a huge difference to uh, the way we have used uh, health technology and, and uh, uh, reacted to, to the pandemic. In terms of digital health AI or however we, we, we call it, I, I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of the effort that's already being made within uh, Bhutan to uh, address this and, and to ensure that, that much of the learning that, that uh, is already available is, is, is brought to bear. So. Uh, your use of a unique uh, citizen identifier, the, the principles of quick and equal access to healthcare, linkage of me medical records, um, uh, th they're all things that, that, are, that are important. And the setting, of course, is hugely different from the UK, where there is a, a system that's been in place for, for, for many years. 
I mean, it might help to just talk about, so I, I started to work, when I started to work as a, as a, as a general practitioner, a GP or a primary care physician, um, medical records were handwritten on small cards stored in cardboard, cardboard folders in, in shelves around our reception office. Um, and, and that was at that time a system that had been, been in place for almost 80 years. Um, we had a fixed line telephone service. Uh, uh, so that was our, perhaps our one item of communication technology. Um, uh, patients used it to book appointments and summon help in an emergency. Um, but no one considered that uh, it was a, a medium through which we could consider diagnosis and treatment of patients. Uh, a face-to-face -face appointment was, was very much what was felt to, to be needed. Um, uh, and the idea of using a, a, a telephone to, to do that would, would feel very strange uh, at the time. I mean, obviously over the last 40 years, there's been an absolute revolution in communications and uh, computing uh, with, with the two technologies converging into um, what, the, the great majority of us now hold, which are which are globally linked handheld computers. Um, our, our handwritten medical records have been transferred to computer um, and electronic communications expanded across uh, healthcare uh, within within the UK and, and across many parts of the world. But I think the, the, the and until COVID hit, the day-to-day -day experience of people who wanted to see a doctor remained much the same. Um, you know, my patients uh, booked their appointments by telephone. Uh, they came to a face-to-face -face, face -face appointment. Uh, I carried out a, a physical examination and tests and talked to them uh, and printed out a, a, a computer-generated prescription which the patient would take to the pharmacy. Um, we ordered blood tests uh, on the computer uh, but the, 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 the patients had to make an appointment at the clinic to, to have them. So there was a move to digital, which was already taking place, um, but progress had been slow. Um, the long-term plan for the UK's National Health Service was published in 2019, and it set out a vision for a, a digital first UK National Health Service so that people would speak to a doctor by phone before attending the clinic, use websites to get initial advice about their health conditions, uh, and more use of telemedicine by hospitals. Uh, and, and that was much debated and, and, and much discussion around it. Less than 15 months later, um, the, the UK's National Health Service went digital first by necessity. So, you know, in early March 2020, uh, I was doing a clinic um, a couple of times a week, seeing 15 to 20 patients face to face in the morning or an afternoon. A week later, I switched to carrying out an entirely remote uh, clinic, seeing, you know, talking to, to a similar number of people on the telephone and uh, doing everything electronically. So this was a complete uh, and dramatic shift in, in the way of working. So, you know, it was, it was difficult for us because we had to do new things uh, and patients also found it unfamiliar. But we'd actually got all the technology in place to do it. We've got computers on our desks, we've got telephones, we've got the internet for, for, for linking. We had mobile phones or patients had mobile phones with cameras uh, and could send us pictures of their skin rashes. Uh, and we quickly became adept at using those to uh, store them on the computers and to send people printed advice, send people advice leaflets uh, on the internet rather than giving them a printed advice leaflet. So your question was about the vision for healthcare over the next five years and uh, about the impact of COVID. Well, I, th I think COVID has probably taught us that the idea of face-to-face -face consultations may be convenient for a hospital or health clinic, but perhaps not necessarily for, for patients. Um, uh, in the UK, travel to a clinic, waiting to see a doctor, having to go to a pharmacy to take a prescription and then go back to the pharmacy to pick up a medicine is not necessarily the most convenient way. And to be able to do all of that electronically whilst at home or at work with a device that they have with them all the time is, is clearly something that's much more attractive 
and in the context of COVID, of course, uh, avoids the the face to face contact that that's uh, so um, much to be avoided uh, at the moment in terms of trying to uh, avoid spread of, of, of the disease. I guess there are two additional things that that might be worth saying about um, this flexible ver- vision of of healthcare. Uh, for the future uh, and how we're going to make best use of that. Firstly, there are very large amounts of data about individual patients that are not being put to best use. Uh, For example, uh, and and you talked about AI and the potential for that, uh, the way that we can actually take data about people and look at their future risk of illness and predict uh, issues that might arise with their health. And we still don't have uh, all of the medical records data that we need to do that. We don't have it necessarily brought together across organizations. Uh, And secondly, the the issue of home diagnostics. um, uh, Deshu Kama referred to the work we've done on wearables. There is a a huge potential to make more use of that sort of approach uh, for people in their own homes so that we can uh, avoid again bringing them into hospital or, or a clinic and exposing them to to, to the risk of, of, of disease, um, and, and that's an area which which I'm happy to talk about later, as it is where I've, I've I've done the research. So, for example, measuring blood glucose and blood pressure levels at home can help monitor people with with long term conditions like hypertension and, and diabetes. Um, uh, so collecting that data together and making the best use of them is really important. So, you know, this is a, this is a really big challenge uh, as to how we will take things forward in, in, in the uh, COVID era. I think it's probably too soon to say post-COVID era. Um, uh, but there are still people who don't have mobile phones, who don't have access to, to technology. Uh, and I think trying to think about them in terms of of how we can take forward the use of digital at the same time not leading to an excluded class of people in terms of healthcare is is a really important challenge. So I should leave it there and and, and, and turn this into a conversation perhaps rather than me uh, uh, offering a lecture. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Andrew. I can already see the see the difficulty in in uh, in yourself addressing this uh, forum because uh, of the um, amount of exposure you have, uh, specialty that you are in, that, that your heart lies in uh, digitalizing healthcare system. Yet you have to squeeze everything in a very short time. I know that is going to be very difficult. Yet uh, we have to make it. The conversation has to be not between two of us, but uh, make it a little more uh, comfortable for all uh, non-health participants here to enjoy the conversation also. So uh, on this note, uh, we we are aware of your um, uh, researches into especially diabetes and care of diabetes by the primary healthcare physicians, as well as timely detection and self-referral by themselves. So uh, that is one thing where probably digitalizing healthcare can come in very easily because the, there are certain components that uh, smartphones can pick it up on the spot. So with this, uh, I know traditionally when we say uh, uh, treatment of a disease, traditionally when we say diagnosis of a disease, the patient wants themselves to be in front of the physician because of our human values and human touch. Leaving that aside, how do you think we can actually detect are diseases on time and treat them or offer interventions at the site uh, uh, more efficiently without having to uh, bring the patient all the way in front of the physician. Maybe you may not be able to understand what I'm trying to describe, but in our part of the world, especially in Bhutan, I think uh, to travel a short distance, it takes a number of hours. Maybe to cover 20 kilometers, you need to drive for a day, or maybe to cover five kilometers, you might have to walk a day. So given that, uh, given that uh, uh, background, uh, we know IT, uh, IT sanitization of uh, uh, everyday business is happening, happening at a rapid pace. What are your ad- advices for us to make this 
uh, remote management system very efficient in our part of the world. I'm not talk, talking about to the extent of robotic surgeries, but to apply those principles on our remote part. Um, thank you, um, your, your Excellency. I, I think that there is, it, it might be helpful just to talk about um, uh, the, the work we originally did with, with uh, people who, young people who had diabetes and needed insulin treatment. Um, um, and one of the challenges for, for, for people who use insulin is, is adjusting the amount of insulin that they need uh, to actually cope with their day-to-day -day life. Um, and uh, the way this is often done is, is really people measure their own blood glucose levels with, with devices, which are, um, uh, you, know, you know, when we started this work, the, these were devices that people had that uh, provided a, a very clear measurement of uh, the, uh, the, the, the blood glucose that could, could help influence treatment, but people didn't know how to use that. Um, and so the work that we originally did was, was to, to link these blood glucose meters to mobile phones so that the data could be sent to their physician. And so, you know, I had the privilege back in 2003, 2004 of working with uh, a, a, a large group of, of young adults with diabetes uh, uh, and, and a nurse and, and remotely um, being able to see all of the blood glucose readings that they had made over the, the previous uh, week or, or 10 days and being able to guide them in uh, adjusting their own insulin treatment, which of course would have been completely impossible uh, uh, in, in doing that on a face-to-face -face basis. Now, you know, whether these are people who, who are, you know, five miles apart from me or, you know, a thousand miles apart, it, it, it would make little difference. Um, and it's that type of approach where you can use very simple technology, things that are available uh, anyway, uh, that um, can help improve care. So that, that system uh, we developed over the years and has now uh, found a, a particular use for, for women in pregnancy with, with a, a type of diabetes called gestational diabetes. Uh, so this is a, a condition that comes on in pregnancy and requires insulin treatment to, for many to, to, to help treatment. Um, you know, until five years ago, these, these people, these women were having to come into the clinic uh, every two weeks to be seen to discuss their treatment. Um, uh, and from their point of view, that was, was, was very um, difficult. Um, you know, it, it, it just driving in. Now, in, in, in your context, it's very, very much the same same issue that is a, a system that can now allow uh, w women to speak directly to their nurse for all of the information about their uh, blood uh, glucose levels to be seen immediately by the clinician and advice offered immediately so it's but the, the basic technology is, is 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 one that is widely available which is a a, a blood glucose meter uh, that is now already uh, linked uh, to mobile phones and and a straightforward mobile phone, um, so it's 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 a way of, of of using things that are available anyway to to help with healthcare. So I hope that gives an illustration of of, of things that could be adapted in in your setting and how they might be used. All right, thank you. I mean, uh, for, for, for the listening pleasure of uh, many non-medicals here that currently, if you have to uh, diagnose uh, type two diabetes, especially, uh, you'll have to go to a physician, uh, get a blood check to, without eating anything in the morning, fasting, and then maybe two hours after your breakfast, you will get it done again. And then you, they might also advise uh, you to get a hemoglobin A1C level so that uh, your last uh, couple of days, uh, glucose, uh, uh, blood sugar, a level would also be uh, reflected. That is the conventional way of diagnosing. What Dr. Andrew is saying is that uh, you could easily do it. Your blood sugar level could easily be picked up by one of your smartphones. And then uh, uh, going forward, uh, if you have an app on your smartphone uh, and a small device to deliver the uh, uh, insulin in your body, that's the treatment for diabetes, uh, that, uh, that small app with, on your smartphone can easily do it. 
meaning you need not visit a physician to see whether you have diabetes or not. If you have one based on your blood sugar level designed by the, uh, detected by the app on your smartphone, insulin dosage can also be decided and determined and also injected through the use of a small smartphone through an app. That is what Dr. Andrew is trying to say. So my question, maybe in a very short way, how long do you think those uh, um, app-based uh, treating uh, a very uh, devastating disease, uh, chronic debilitating disease like diabetes uh, uh, to come to this part of the world? It, it, I, I think those technologies are uh, available at the moment. I mean, the, 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 the cost in the UK of the, the equipment I'm talking about is, you know, it, it, it's in, in the region of, of, of you know, uh, 150 UK pounds, you, you know, $160. Um, but uh, I, I think in the context you're talking about, that is something that actually could be used uh, not necessarily by an individual, but by a, by a health post, by a health clinic um, and with appropriate, um, uh, with, with appropriate uh, infection control procedures. Uh, could well be used to, to, to check people up on a regular basis and, and allow uh, data transmission to uh, uh, a, a, a specialist center to provide the sort of support that would be necessary. Um, so it, it, it's partly a matter of, of getting the communication software organized to uh, let that um, process happen. Um, but but the, the, the basic technology and the equipment is, 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 is very much available at the moment. Thank you. I think you're being too kind or diplomatic not to say that it is up to the healthcare planners, uh, which I see some healthcare planners here, uh, myself included. I think Dr. Andrew is trying to say that it's about whether you know it or not. The technology is already there. If you know it, uh, design a policy accordingly and bring it to uh, for the clinical use. Because in the long run, that would actually be more effective. That would actually would have saved us a lot of cost. Uh, for your information, uh, um, maybe one, one of the most common cause of uh, preventable blindness would be diabetic retinopathy, uh, nerve damage because of diabetes uh, resulting in permanent damage of your vision. So those things are the ones that results more frequently from uh, uh, improperly controlled blood sugar. So uh, um, that is what probably Dr. Andrew wants to say, uh, that, that technology is out there. It's not very expensive. It's all about whether the health planners are aware of it or not. So I think we must uh, keep those in mind. On the other side now, uh, as we all know that uh, for anything to be digitalized, for any data that we want to make, uh, make it usable in a digital format, we must have a good, reliable ways that we collect data. And then we must also have a, a very good system to use the data. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we cannot be talking anything in, in modern concept. And I, in the crowd, I see uh, our Honorable Director for our National Statistics Bureau. I think uh, he will be there to take note of that. In your, in your experience, Dr. Andrew, I know uh, um, uh, we would be somewhere where your system was some 30, 40 years back, but we would not like to take these 30 years to reach where you are now today. We would, we would like to leapfrog and reach where you are now in maybe next uh, two years or three years. So what, what, what were the challenges when we had to, when you had to digitalize your data into a usable format? What are the challenges that you had so that we need not waste so much time into, uh, into uh, um, getting uh, the data usable? Just for your information, uh, uh, we had started on that. Uh, we uh, are working on a national uh, 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 flagship program to digitalize our medical record system. We are calling it electronic patient record system so that all the data that we collect are on a digital format so that we can use uh, uh, it for our future. Uh, all the uh, uh, technologies actually can ride on that data. So what would be your suggestion for us? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an absolutely fascinating question. Um, and, and yes, uh, I, I was responsible for bringing the first computer into my practice and, and transferring uh, the, the medical records onto the computer in that. Um, but I think what's changed uh, is, 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 the, is the technology we now have available. So it's not going to take uh, anything like the same time uh, 
because the, the technology is already up to the task, uh, is already available to be able to, to deliver a very high quality of, of medical records. So I think that there are two, two, two challenges. One is why, do, why, do, why does one want to use the data? And when, when I was involved in developing GP computer systems, um, our aim was to improve the care we were offering. We as GPs wanted to put data onto the computer that would help us improve the care of people. We wanted to record the drugs that people were taking. We wanted to record the health conditions they had so we could offer care proactively to them so that we could identify people with diabetes and make sure that they had the necessary checks to keep them healthy. Um, I know in other parts of the world, the focus of computerization was very much around uh, billing processes to, to, to make sure that the, 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 the necessary payments were made for, for patient services. Um, in, in the UK, I think that the, the principle of, of, of uh, medical records to improve care has, has, has main, been maintained. But the really big challenge for all of us, and, and one that perhaps has only started to be solved in the past three or four years, is the linkage of data between different parts of the health system. So hospitals uh, developed their own computer systems, primary care developed its own computer systems, and the data was, was held in two different silos. And I think if there's a lesson, which, which I suspect you already have very clearly uh, in, in mind as an objective is to make sure that the data is completely interchangeable. Uh, I think the opportunity going forward with, with, with um, digital healthcare is, is that um, care isn't going to be determined by the place that you're receiving your care at. You know, if you're at a health post uh, in the mountains or you're at a hospital in, in, in the city, uh, you know, the same care should be available across both those sites. Um, uh, and, you know, apart from some, some items of, you know, specialist uh, um, diagnostics, you know, with, with all of the opportunities we have, it should be possible to link up the data from those systems so that in trying to predict, for example, you know, with the data from both, from, from, from both hospital and a primary care post used together that could be used to uh, inform uh, uh, ways of, of, of predicting uh, the course of illness, illness or whether people are at risk of, of, of some form of, of health problem or not. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I know, I know when we, when we uh, talk about uh, health data, one has to have a common format that can be usable. Currently, since we do not have uh, a common platform being created centrally uh, uh, in the country, we, when you talk about hospitals, we talk about almost 26 hospitals in the country. And then maybe at a national level, uh, it may sound uh, uh, like a big task, but actually when we come down to the number of beds, which almost every hospital tends to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, standardizing about, we only have less than 1,000 beds in the country. So I think the whole country is running a very small hospital actually, because elsewhere a university hospital alone will have 2,000, 2,500 beds. But in our country, the whole nation uh, runs only about a 1,000 bedded hospital. So we could actually run the whole hospitals in the country like a small hospital, like one singular hospital. And then on the data, I think as simple as pronouncing and writing our names spelled out correctly. As we talk, even my name is spelled to two, three different uh, ways. Some people would call it L-O-T-A-Y, some spell it L-O-T-E-Y. So uh, I don't think that would, uh, that would mean uh, much when we say digitalizing our health data system. So uh, we have been emphasizing that, uh, that we must uh, spell out our names correctly. And then we must have one good uh, disease coding system for us to have a good usable data later. I don't think any physician can use, uh, 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 can diagnose a disease in his or her own manner. He or she cannot spell out the disease in his or her own uh, wins and fancies. We must have one common platform so that, uh, so that the system will recognize the diagnosis. 
So those are the those are the pr pretty basic things that we are talking about. So that when we actually uh, roll out our electronic patient record system, uh, it will be a smooth ride for us. I'm sure uh, your center must have gone through this uh, some decades ahead, but now you are already up and about. So uh, that is what uh, we wanted to learn from you, if not uh, from this short one hour session, maybe that is where two of us uh, will spend some time on this. I, I think that's, it, it, that, that's a very interesting uh, angle on this. So you are absolutely right. When we first introduced the, the computer system, uh, we, um, we kept to the, the simple important things. The first things we put on the system were the, the, the uh, people who had uh, long-term disabilities so that we could identify them. We included the people uh, who had long-term conditions, so diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, chronic lung disease. Um, these were all the priorities to put onto, onto the system. So there, there are you know, thousands of, of, of diagnoses that one could put on and you could put them on in different ways, but the priority was to identify the people at risk and to ensure that they were first labeled onto the computer. Um, and then what we did with that was to uh, identify what we wanted to do in terms of maintain a, a minimum set of things that we thought should be offered to these people on an annual basis to ensure that they maintain their health. So, for example, making sure that we sort of check their the medicines they were taking once a year uh, to uh, check that they uh, their blood pressure remained under control. Uh, and for people with diabetes, as you, as you rightly said earlier, uh, uh, to, to check whether or not, for example, they were starting to develop uh, retinal eye disease, uh, which could cause blindness. So there are simple checks that one can do on people who have long-term conditions to ensure that, they're, that they remain well and, and their condition does not deteriorate. Uh, and all those are things that we could do with the computer because the computer could remind us to, to see these people. Uh, and as things, as, as time has developed, we can now send people uh, communications by text message to remind them to come for appointments. Um, uh, and so starting with, with as you say, the, the very basic things, uh, you know, identifying the people who are most at risk and identifying the things that the health service needs to offer to them. Uh, the, the use of computers is, is able to, to help us uh, develop systems to make sure those basic care processes get delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to compare our healthcare system with yours, but we have one similarity uh, uh, whereby it's totally public healthcare system is taken care of by the state. Uh, in Bhutan also is a totally uh, um, a free or state catered healthcare system, which is very close to your NHS uh, system. Um, in our system, uh, we, of course, uh, I mean, I don't mean to be uh, complaining too much about our system, but uh, uh, the facts are facts. Uh, we had been talking a lot about uh, patient referral system in the country. And of course, again, in black and white, we have a referral system whereby the, the the first layer or the, or the outermost layer of the reference system is a BHU system, the basic health unit system. That goes to the next layer called the district hospital level system. Then it goes to the regional hospital level system and then comes to the national hospital, uh, national referral system. Uh, that is only in, 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 in black and white. But in practice, many patients do not uh, or cannot follow this path because uh, at many times, uh, we do not have the relevant specialists in all those tiers of referral system. At other times, uh, people want uh, to get their health being uh, given in, to the hands uh, of the best specialist that we have in the country. So that way, I think our referral system could never be implemented properly. I'm sure your healthcare system must have gone through similar stages also. So on this note, using, using technology, how can we make use of limited resources, less number of specialists to be to be at the services of all peripheral healthcare system. I, um, Your Excellency, that that just that that describes the the NHS very clearly. I mean, there are very much uh, a, a tiered series of uh, re referral systems uh, in place. So, 
um, the, the traditional view of the, of the UK National Health Service would be uh, primary care or general practice providing the first layer, referring to a district hospital, uh, and then a district hospital referring to, to what we would call a tertiary care or third level centre. Um, and, and exactly the same sort of issues that you've outlined uh, have, have been uh, issues within the, the, the UK's NHS. Um, so there are a number of ways in, in which the system, so, so the, the problem that arises for, from that is, is that if people uh, access uh, a tertiary level hospital, a, a, a highly specialist hospital as a first point of call, they are often treated in a way where um, uh, the focus is, is, is a very narrow one and not necessarily looking at the whole person and, and, and the whole uh, area of their health. Um, and so the sort of things that have, have been put into place is firstly, there's now very much an emphasis on what we would call the self-care system. Uh, so before going to the GP to, to provide resources for people to look at what they might be able to do to look after themselves. And that's what many people want to do. They want, you know, access to information uh, that allows them to, to, to manage their own conditions. It's very rare now that I get someone to come and, that comes to see me as, as a GP or phones me up now, I should say, without having first looked at a website and trying to work out what is what's you know what their what their own problem is, um, so and, and often people are able to to manage their own problems with that. So um, or, or they bring to me a, a much clearer idea of what what might be wrong with them and what they are expecting from the healthcare system. There's another aspect that that we've tried to to sort out in the UK as well, and that is. Um, rather than just seeing the, the general practitioner or the primary care physician as, as the only way to, to, to get into the health system, uh, there are now, for example, people can access mental health care uh, directly without having to go through a general practitioner. They can uh, contact the, the local psychological uh, and mental health services uh, to discuss you know, the fact that they are feeling anxious, as, as you mentioned earlier, or depressed. Uh, and that can often be handled in parallel to, to the other systems. The other thing is, is as a GP, um, I don't just, in terms of if a person has a problem, I don't just have to send them to the hospital. I have a number of other options. I can email a specialist and ask their advice. There are email uh, referrals, you know, email, special email addresses that are monitored uh, on a 24-hour basis by the hospital and uh, they can respond uh, with um, advice about how someone can be managed uh, within practice without necessarily having to be seen in a specialist centre. So the aim, uh, again, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the data is shared across all of these systems, so the specialist can look at uh, the, you know, the medical records of that person who I'm sending an email about. So the aim is to sort of get away from having a rigid system of layers with perhaps aspects of the system considered gatekeepers, you know, people who are there to stop people getting to the, to the next layer, but, but to facilitate smooth movement between the layers. And the most important layer of that are the people with multiple long-term conditions. Uh, who um, are perhaps frail or, um, you know, uh, if, if, if someone with, with, with three or four medical conditions goes into a highly specialist hospital, they are likely to be seen by four specialists, you know, one, one for their kidney, uh, one for their heart, um, and, and so on. Um, so for, pe for, for people who do have these conditions, it's really important that their care is directed towards a generalist. Uh, and someone who can be efficient about managing all of their conditions. And I think that's where shared use of the data is so important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Ms. Tewang or Tashukamura's office can take some questions if there are, because uh, uh, you might be having uh, better questions to ask uh, uh, Dr. Andrew rather than myself. On this note, uh, um, 
I know from one side, uh, uh, technologies have advanced so, 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 so much that you could almost detect uh, uh, some metabolic changes in your body, like diabetes, change of your blood pressure, changes of your heartbeat through which you can predict a lot of uh, diseases. But from other side, in our part of the world, in Bhutan in particular, we are not able to actually streamline the, our referral system. Again, uh, on the record, I don't mean to complain a, a lot about it because I'm part of this. On our system, macroscopically, uh, we needed to um, streamline our referral system, whereby, as you rightly said, uh, many, many patients that flock the central referral centers or, or tertiary level hospitals need not be coming. They need not even leave their homes, actually, yet be connected to their uh, primary care physician. So that is uh, now what we have to uh, um, uh, follow up on or work on. As you said, uh, um, most of the diseases, if this can be picked up by themselves and be connected remotely to their uh, primary care physician, almost, I would say, more than 50% of the care can also be given remotely. And then what cannot be done remotely can, can be uh, a streamlined through our referral system. I had uh, pointed out to our healthcare uh, uh, policy makers that, uh, that we have a very good uh, uh, HIV control program at the Ministry of Health. We have a very good malaria control program uh, uh, at our um, Ministry of Health. We also have uh, many disease particular uh, control programs that is functioning very well. I was thinking if we had a referral system control program or improvement program at the ministry, I think these technologies would have come in a decades ahead. On this, uh, uh, we do not have a, a doctor or a healthcare uh, specialist or anybody who's interested in this looking after uh, technologies to come into healthcare system. How did you or your system introduce yourself? Did it come from your natural interest or, or you got driven into uh, health technologies uh, based by the system that you have in your country? Um, I, I, I think the, the, the way that I sort of became involved with this um, was really because I wanted to improve things as a GP. So, um, you know, I wanted to improve patient care. Um, so, you know, the systems we had in place uh, were, were very cumbersome to, for, for, for managing, uh, for, for identifying people. So, you know, as, as I said, we started with a, a card system for, for just recording chronic diseases. So the opportunity for putting that onto a computer, there was a certain amount of, of um, uh, sort of optimism that the, the, the course of, of, of using computers in the future would, 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 would take things on further, as indeed they have. Um, and I think it's always been looking for what, is the, what are the next steps that would actually improve what we're able to do. And then when I had the opportunity to move into research, uh, I could actually sort of move from being a, a GP looking at what was available and, and what we wanted, uh, you know, what we might want to do to actually trying to be more proactive and saying, you know, we have the technology. I mean, I, I work with fantastic uh, engineers um, uh, or biomedical engineers. And, and for example, you're, you're talking about uh, you using technology to be able to remotely measure people's um, pulse or their oxygen, uh, levels of oxygen in their blood. Well, you know, th th they're able to do that with cameras. They have developed the, the uh, algorithms uh, that can take a signal from a camera uh, and, and look at the changes in, in blood flow uh, across someone's face to, to actually be able to, to tell you what the pulse is and what the levels of oxygen saturation is. And, and you know, those are now uh, being used to, to monitor patients in intensive care. Uh, or, um, you know, in, 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 in other forms of, of uh, you know, we, we, it was used in the hospital uh, uh, to be able to monitor pe to people regularly when they were um, sort of to, to avoid a nurse actually having to go to patients and doing those observations on such a regular basis. Um, so, you know, the, these, these ideas are, are rapidly coming into to wider availability. Now, they're not quite at the stage of being on a smartphone, but 
you know, they will be in a fairly short time. So um, it, it's really staying optimistic about what the, you know, what the, what the sort of future potential is and making sure that uh, the system is built to take on these changes. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that people get drawn into to discussing issues like, um, you know, the system architecture for, for healthcare and the, the IT system architecture for, for developing, uh, you know, a medical care system. Um, but, um, and, and those are really useful as targets, uh, as, as, as frameworks within which to work, but they become outdated very quickly. And it's really important to keep them under constant review by what's actually becoming available. All right, uh, I see one hands up, uh, Dr. Yojana from Germany. Hello. Yes, Doc, can you go ahead, please? Yeah, Comment thank you so question. much. Uh, it's a question. First of all, a very, very insightful discussion. Thank you so much for making us part of this. So um, in general, I just wanted to ask about uh, the challenges and opportunities for uh, digital health implementation in Bhutan. And uh, also, if uh, uh, from a policy perspective, there are any opportunities for private players to offer these services in Bhutan at the moment. Uh, Dr. Yojana, I mean, private players for healthcare service system or, or uh, maybe technology front? Technology front. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, that, that should be more than welcome because that is what we wanted to do. Uh, we cannot depend on ourselves uh, all three and three in terms of uh, uh, technological advances because uh, we are not that much advanced uh, on that front, but that doesn't mean we cannot do it. Just that the know-how had not been there for us. And uh, since healthcare system was totally taken care of by the government, uh, probably the private sector did not find the need to, to uh, venture into that. At the same time, on the government side, as we all know globally, there is always some sort of time lag when it comes to uh, anything being handled by government. Uh, that is always there. So I think that much we, that much we must admit that we have lost uh, quite a bit of time in, in healthcare advances, uh, uh, given the fact that everything was done by the government. So uh, to answer your question straight, yes, definitely uh, we will. There'll be there'll be will be. Uh, more than happy to have any private player when it comes to technological advancements to be incorporated in the health system. That's that's very good and encouraging to hear. Uh, I don't know if this is the right forum, but uh, if uh, there could be a process uh, through which we can reach out if we want to do something in that direction. Sure, I mean, if we have the heart, there should not be any barrier between the heart. So we will be more than happy to work together uh, one of I see a lot of my office uh, staff here. Please connect to Dr. Jane and see how we can work. Uh, because uh, I'm a strong believer that uh, big opportunities uh, come in smaller packages. Mm -hmm. We must know that the, that opportunity doors are always there. It's it, it all lies on how how far and how fast you can identify those doors and open for you. So uh, I'll be more than happy to work with you, Dr. Jane. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. If, if I can just. Come in on that. I mean, I, I think the sort of it, 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 there is a real so, so academics are very good at um, coming up with ideas, uh, testing them out. Um, but I think there's a real a, a, def, a different skill set needed to implement things at a very wide scale, uh, and that's a skill set that that I think. Um, uh, commercial or um, uh, private in industries are, are very good at doing. And I think what's needed is a, is a clear understanding of the framework within which they're doing that. Uh, and I think you know, what I've, I've heard today is, is that there's a very clear national framework in Bhutan for, for trying to, to, to manage these things and offering direction to that. Um, but you know, the actual skill sets of, of, of delivering things. And, Certainly, in the work we've done, uh, you know, two of the things I've been involved with, with have been taken up by a private company who has then worked very closely with the NHS to to, to deliver those in in in, um, in in a hospital setting. Um, uh, and you know, that's not something that that could have been done from an academic side. Thank you. All right, thank you. I mean, I can see one question here saying. Uh, what are the newer technologies being used in the UK when it comes to controlling COVID? Mm -hmm. But I also see some other follow-up questions by different uh, 
um, experts here saying, how can you how can you protect and assure privacy when it comes to uh, uh, personal data being shared? So I think this is two conflicting questions already being asked here. Dr. Andrew, if you can let us know what are the newer technologies that you are or your system is using uh, um, for this pandemic. And um, I think um, we really need to, we have so many things to really do. So, so in terms of the newer technologies, I think the real, where, where progress is being made rapidly, it is in the better use of data. So the use of machine learning um, and uh, AI techniques to, to, to make the best use of the data. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, there are many technologies coming, uh, particularly in terms of, 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 of small monitors that can be uh, used with people um, in, in a hospital or home setting to, to record things like their temperature, pulse, mobility. And we've done some really uh, interesting work on people recovering from surgery, for example, uh, where uh, we can show that uh, we can we can we can uh, work out uh, the signals coming from someone who is recovering normally and able to get up and move around and someone who isn't recovering as well and, and is perhaps more confined to a chair. So, you know, that sort of technology, you know, putting a, a monitor on someone uh, as, as they go home and then just keeping a, a remote eye on them to, 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 to identify who's going to need additional help. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, what the one then needs from that is the data and then using that to, to make predictions about, uh, you know, who needs the, the additional help or not. Um, I think the issues around data security are absolutely paramount. Um, it, it's, it's a huge issue that has in the past uh, led to big, um, you know, led, led to lines of... of, of, of uh, government um, uh, strategy being uh, perhaps pulled back and, and, and reassessed. Um, but all of the work that, that you know, we have done with, with this technology, it has huge layers of um, security in it. Um, so for example, a, a mobile phone uh, can be, you know, is, is identified with an individual. It has a, a hardware number, a number in it so that you, you can use that to uh, ensure that any data uh, that's held on that is, is secure and that only someone uh, with the authorization can access data from that, that phone. And similarly, there, there are many techniques uh, that are now in place uh, you, you know, using the mobile phone, which is with, you know, with, with someone on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to, to ensure that that, that uh, provides the the security link, um, but that you know that that, that that side of things should not be a barrier. Uh, I mean, people should be confident that uh, that their data is is, is held secure, securely, uh, and that's a largely a technical matter to make it happen, and, and governance matter. That's true. I mean. Uh, um... All, all the measures that we can take or all measures that we take against uh, any infectious disease uh, and COVID-19 in particular are against social norms. So it's, it's not that is the most uh, difficult challenge that any government or healthcare system is facing now. Because anything that you want to do normally, you will not be allowed during such infectious disease outbreak. So that being the basic challenge that we all must understand and follow. I don't think there's uh, any technology that will make you follow those COVID norms comfortably. And then uh, for the information of many non-medical friends here, that uh, the present pandemic is the COVID-19, which is a medical diagnosis. COVID-19 is the diagnosis, and it is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is the current pandemic. I really appreciate uh, the experts who gave these names because uh, it is now, uh, left on our tables to follow it. We really don't know where SARS-CoV-3 is getting cooked. SARS-CoV-2 is now ravaging the world, but we really don't know where sars -CoV where in which corner of the uh, planet is SARS-CoV-3 being cooked. Will SARS-CoV-3 cause COVID-25 or COVID-30? We don't know. So I think uh, 
the experts now have uh, given a very uh, strong and clear indication that pandemics uh, will keep coming. It's all in our uh, hands to be uh, ready for that. As we fight this present pandemic, we must also both from, from public point of view as well as governance point of view, we must be ready to uh, um, defer or delay the onset of the next pandemic. But uh, I'm very hopeful that with the advent of uh, technologies coming up very fast, and I see uh, our boss at the Royal Center for Disease Control also in the group that uh, we're very happy that uh, the technological advances, advancements have come in very rapidly and timely, I would say. Had it been not for the uh, mRNA vaccine uh, technology, probably we would still be looking for a vaccine uh, uh, to be coming up. So that, that has come up in a big way and such technologies will definitely change the face of medical care in, 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 in near future. And as we talk, <clears throat> Bhutan is, uh, we are uh, uh, planning to have our first uh, medical college in the country. Of course, uh, it is quite uh, embarrassing for a country not to have a medical college, but we are talking about a country with little more than half a million population. So uh, by that, uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, surprising not to have a medical college, but yet, uh, we are planning to have one. And there also is very simple that now a medical college, we need not base on a similar formula that uh, other medical colleges were based on. As simple as we need not spend so much time on having or learning dissection and anatomy on, uh, on a real dead body because of the virtual and mixed realities now. We can almost conjure up anything on, on, on a real time basis. So uh, uh, those are the technologies that is helping us a lot with this augmented reality, with 3D printing system that is coming up. All medical processes that we want to use now can be tailor-made to your exact size and shape that your body needs it. We need not depend on uh, small, medium, large, and XL size anymore. Those implants can be as precise and as comfortable as we want. So medical technologies actually have come up a long way. And I'm sure all will agree that the medical field uh, is the field where technology, uh, uh, technological advancement and digitalization has happened uh, maximum. All because I personally feel because of uh, dependable, reliable data that we have, because of our medical ethics, we are made, we are trained, we are designed to collect raw lots of, uh, all the data that we collect has to be uh, correct because of uh, lots of norms that we have. So because we have lots of reliable data, it is very easy to uh, digitalize that and then uh, uh, let AI and systems driven by AI uh, run on to it or write on to it. So I think that is one reason why uh, healthcare system is the most studied and rapidly digitalizing system. And on the other side, on a con uh, uh, maybe on a commercial side, since healthcare touches everyone's heart, nobody wants to compromise on standards of healthcare. So business also comes in through that. Nobody, nobody do not compromise on healthcare uh, uh, quality and standards. So um, from the little practice, little experience that I had during our training and during my initial times of practice, we know we had AI in our practice. As simple as the EKG that we read, ECG, the health uh, uh, heart uh, tracing that we have, we call it EKG or ECG. There's one on the left-hand side corner a diagnosis given by the machine at all times. But we were taught not to go by that list, uh, diagnosis given by the machine. That is nothing but AI actually. Artificial intelligence is actually giving us a diagnosis of the heart condition, but we were taught not to follow that. We were actually told not to even look at that. Some of the professors would have ripped that part of the paper uh, away from us saying that is a wrong diagnosis. How can a machine read somebody else's heart conditions? Now we have come a stage where, as a, as a physician myself, as, a, as a, a practicing surgeon myself, I don't feel comfortable without having a look at that. My confidence is already shaken by that because more often the human error tends to take the upper hand. We tend to make little more subtle mistakes, but the machine do not make mistakes. They may not be able to detect newer diseases if the information is not fed. But then, uh, most of the time they are correct. But now what is stopping us from making that as our uh, standard uh, of care is probably the medical ethics in different countries. All the AI made diagnosis will still have to be confirmed by a physician. 
but maybe in the future, all the diagnosis made by the physicians will have to be cross-checked with what the AI says. So if there's a little switch in the uh, medical ethics system, then AI probably will come in in a little faster way, which I personally feel should because that is technology that makes very less mistakes. That AI or the technology never gets burnt out, but we do as uh, human, uh, uh, human beings, we do get burnt out. We have our mood swings that will directly or indirectly uh, uh, translate into patient care. So with this note, I think we are running short of time. If, uh, if anyone has any more questions, if not, uh, I will let Dr. Andrew take the floor and, uh, uh, and conclude for us. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, there's, I, I think many, there are many questions, but uh, at least one, uh, Andrew, could uh, stretch your time to answer. And that is uh, uh, how, uh, the, what, uh, what is the status of health data sharing in hospitals across UK? Uh, there are a bunch of questions, but uh, this was the first one. So I just went by sequence. So I'm giving attention to this first one. Okay. Thank you, Dasha. I, I think it's actually a really important question. Um, uh, so uh, again, it, it's a COVID answer to this. Um, so before COVID, uh, the, the data is shared uh, in the primary care system. So, um, uh, you know, when, 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 a, when a patient moves across uh, the, 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 the UK to a different um, uh, uh, place, to a different town, uh, their data can be transferred with them and, and I can uh, access data on, on people, um, uh, you know, anyone in the country. I, if, if, if I had a, a reason to, I could access their data. So there is complete sharing. Uh, for, for primary care of at least the basics. Hospitals have different data systems. So, um, you know, there are a number of major computer, system, computer systems which different hospitals have, but the data is not generally shared between them for the purposes of clinical care. Um, uh, for, the, for the purposes of research though, uh, there's been huge um, steps that have happened during COVID because I think as, as His Excellency um, sort of pointed out, uh, where um, there are hugely urgent reasons to, to, to move things on um, and, and to encourage changes in the system. Uh, so, so data is now, uh, at least for COVID related purposes, can be drawn from almost every uh, hospital in the country and, and for every data system so that the um, uh, you know, issues to do with trying to predict who might become ill from COVID or uh, you know, who, who is at risk of, of, of developing uh, you know, complications from COVID can be uh, done in terms of research. Um, but I, I think the, uh, the, you know, the issue that, that's raised here is with the status of health data, data sharing is, is we, the, um, uh, the, 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 the regulations are much more permissive, uh, partly because the technology is there to preserve the confidentiality of this data, um, uh, but that it still uh, is, is, is not completely shared across the UK. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, um, uh, because of the uh, next engagement for both uh, Honorable Prime Minister and Professor Dr. Andrew, we have to respect. Uh, I think I, I should apologize uh, uh, for the string of questions that remain unanswered. Uh, um, um, so please uh, do excuse us um, for this uh, failure, um, um, but it is a measure of how much uh, curiosity and uh, uh, curiosity that has been awakened by the very uh, gripping dialogue uh, this afternoon. Um, and 
uh, if we see the list of questions, it is uh, going more and more into imaginative and speculative directions about AI and robots and uh, 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 such kind of futuristic uh, scenarios. Uh, so uh, we are very, uh, I think I have to, uh, in the interest of the time of both the imminent speakers, I have to now uh, conclude this uh, session by uh, really expressing the collective gratitude to two of you for this uh, extremely uh, informative, uh, substantial uh, exchange, which um, uh, uh, was so deep and wide ranging. Uh, if I may uh, sort of uh, briefly uh, look back, uh, we discussed uh, on the hierarchy of uh, referral system, uh, um, you know, and uh, uh, Professor Andrew uh, very much highlighted the need for extremely smooth movement between various uh, uh, hierarchical structure. In fact, uh, uh, along with Prime Minister, uh, the the, the uh, direction they indicated uh, to me extremely visionary. For example, Professor Andrew uh, meant, said that care must not be determined by the place you get the health care. Uh, it would put uh, the uh, hierarchy, uh, the referral system uh, upside down, but that is the direction we need to go, I think. Uh, I was also, uh, the next uh, set of issue we discussed today uh, was uh, uh, the key one, I think the technology of uh, healthcare, um, uh, along with the information that is uh, in, in the, uh, within the, the ambit of use of technology. And here again, vivid uh, uh, examples were uh, given to us, uh, such as the uh, use of 160 uh, USD dollar glucometer that would um, you know, expedite uh, uh, the care for the diabetes patients. Um, um, very interesting for, for our country, which is as much as UK focused on well-being, uh, but we call here gross national happiness, and the mental health care featured very strongly, uh, and we are very grateful uh, to both of you for bringing this to the fore. I think we have to drive this forward, uh, not only in the medical system, but into the budgeting system, how to change the object class uh, code classification system, uh, uh, et cetera, to uh, give prominence to GNH elements, including mental health care. Um, the third set of issues we uh, discussed today, which were extremely rich, was on the structure of information and data uh, and the inter interchangeability. It, this was a common thread to uh, in many of our uh, AI governance uh, lecture series. The need to make the data interchangeable uh, while protecting individual uh, rights and liberties. Um, uh, Dr. Andrew called it the system of architecture of data. Uh, uh, so uh, um, uh, um, we have uh, uh, today um, uh, um, it has the discussion drew um, perhaps more than 400 people at this moment. Uh, although you see only 128, there is a, there are another group in the Facebook and uh, in some uh, individual uh, screen, uh, there are hundreds of uh, students. And uh, we are very sorry to students of Motithang, we could not uh, uh, find time to answer uh, some of the interesting questions you uh, posed, but uh, uh, maybe uh, Honorable Prime Minister and Dr. Andrew could uh, uh, indulge and uh, send a paragraph uh, of answer to their uh, probing questions. Um, with this, I'd like to formally um, sort of uh, uh, close so that Honorable Prime Minister and Andrew can leave for the next uh, engagement, uh, pressing engagement. It's very kind of Prime Minister also to consent uh, to participate in this. Uh, uh, in spite of the fact that today was the day of summer parliament inauguration session. Uh, in the morning, he had the uh, parliamentary session and parliament always bring 
a uh, lot more uh, pressing issues, as you know. And we thank Professor Andrew also for taking time uh, to respond uh, to our request uh, through Sabina. And as uh, His Excellency mentioned, uh, may this be the beginning of uh, um, contribution and collaboration with Bhutan. Uh, I thank you all.